Welcome to Hot Chips 27. Session 4, FPGAs. So I'd like to now welcome you to the FPGA session. Um, we have uh, two talks from um, Xilinx and Altera, uh, focusing on their FinFET generation of FPGAs and also their latest SOC um, subsystems. So I'm quite excited about those two talks. And we also have a great presentation from Microsoft with an update on how the deployment of FPGAs in the data centers is, is going. And very relevant for this conference, uh, they have a great case study in terms of using FPGAs for machine learning, and so I'm very much looking forward to all these talks. The first talk will be by uh, Xilinx. The presenter is Vamsi Bovana. Um, Vamsi uh, is serving as the Vice President of uh, Processing Systems, Software, and Applications. Uh, prior to Xilinx, uh, Vamsi worked at uh, Open Silicon, where he was Senior Director of Technology. Um, he is also a co-founder and vice president of engineering at Zenasis Technologies. Uh, he started his career at Fujitsu Labs in America. He studied uh, in India at uh, IIT Kharagpur, where uh, uh, he received his master's. And uh, for the PhD, he went to the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please welcome uh, Vamsi. <clears throat> Thank you, Ralph. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in front of this distinguished audience. Uh, I'm very excited to share information about our new 60 nanometer device um, that's built uh, on top of FinFET technologies, as Ralph mentioned. Um, it's a pretty large team that worked on this program, so it's a privilege for me to represent the effort there. Um, but before I introduce the 60 nanometer device, um, since there seems to be a fair bit of interest in FPGAs for this uh, audience and this conference, I thought it might be a, um, uh, useful to take a quick look back at you know, how FPGAs have evolved. So let me start with uh, the 2064. Anybody know what this device is? Oh, there's many people. It actually predates me, but it's amazing. This is probably the only crowd that knows a lot about this device. Um, so I'll, you know, uh, spare the uh, suspense, if you will. Um, this was actually the first FPGA device, and you know, um, had a whopping 64 flops. And uh, if you think that's a small number, uh, from what I have gathered, it was not an easy device to yield. It was one of the larger dice that was out there, larger than many microprocessors at the time. So um, you know, we've come a long way since uh, that generation, and. Uh, you know, um, a, a, few, a couple of years back, one of our colleagues uh, put this chart together that shows the progression of how FPGAs have uh, evolved. So I won't go into all the details over here, but you know, if you notice that FPGAs have become a lot more capable, uh, they have continued to take advantage of the tremendous process scaling benefits that have been uh, uh, offered over, over, over the last, I would say, you know, 30 years. Um, the logic capacity has increased nearly 10,000x, if you measure it in terms of logic cells. Power and performance um, and cost have all been improved. Of course, you, know, you can see that power and cost have been pushed a lot harder. Uh, performance has started to slow down, but that's probably a lot more because of a deliberate choice to manage power rather than, you know, in this case anyway, due to a fundamental technology limit. But, you know, even probably more significant than a lot of the scaling that we have seen in this chart is actually what you can see in terms of the capabilities of the devices. What started as you know, glue logic devices have started now um, to you know, have all kinds of capabilities and functionality in them. You know, with the addition of block RAM, uh, you got memory on the FPGA, then you got signal processing capabilities with DSPs that got introduced. 
And then, you know, some years back, transceivers got introduced, which made them a lot more capable. And, you know, entire microprocessors have started to get integrated. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a pretty good story, pretty good ride for FPGAs. So if you can ask, you know, so what is the next frontier or what's the real problem with these devices? I think, you know, power and performance, I guess, always tend to be, you know, silicon problems that are uh, important and critical to solve. So that's forever a trend that I think will continue to push. But in an, another, you know, almost overarching trend is, you know, you have all this capability in these devices. Um, how do you actually program them? How do you actually make use of this capability? It's probably a problem that is cuts across all kinds of uh, applications, domains, and usage patterns. So that's something that, you know, we've actually been looking at uh, um, in different ways. How do we make these devices a lot more accessible, a lot more programmable? and offer the capabilities to a large section of users. If you take an FPGA um, you know, with all these capabilities, it still takes programming at a fairly low level. Uh, you have to you know, often write RTL code, you have block abstractions, but fundamentally you have to have a hardware designer to be able to program this device. So a few years back, um, actually at this conference, we actually introduced uh, the uh, device Zinc 7000, which was an attempt for us to address this problem. And uh, the device that was expected to go after um, software programmers that would actually um, allow a new class of users and applications to come to FPGAs. So what was this device? This device was actually um, an integration of a full ARM SOC subsystem into an FPGA. You actually you know, power on the device. It booted up like a processor you know, because it has a processor subsystem. And um, it also allowed you to figure out you know, how to um, accelerate stuff onto the hardware that you needed to, to complement what you could do with software. And I'm very pleased and happy to report that you know, the, this, this product has enjoyed uh, significant market success. You know, we have over a couple thousand sockets in all kinds of different applications. So that's sort of the stage that I'd like to set to introduce today's uh, offering, which is our 16 nanometer device. So as we have learned from how this device was being used and applied in the uh, uh, market, we've actually noticed that our customers are running into certain challenges or certain needs that we expect to service with our next generation offering. So I'll touch upon some of them. Um, as I briefly alluded to, power, performance, cost, you know, they continue to be silicon pressures that we always face. And you know, you know, surprisingly, even what we thought would be pretty lightweight industrial applications are soaking up two A9s, and they said, give us more performance. So performance tends to be you know, at the fore of what we uh, always push. Um, people have asked us for 64-bit processing, not just because you know, it's relevant for these applications, but also because the ecosystem is moving there. So there's been an interest in getting um, uh, the devices over to 64-bit. <clears throat> We've had many applications where they were using the A9s to do real-time processing. They're not necessarily real-time class processors. Uh, they're apps processors, but people were implementing tight code on the A9s uh, to achieve real-time functionality. So we actually thought we could take a step to make that experience better. And um, we also had many applications where people were putting our device next to a controller that could build a human-machine interface. You know, these are you know, applications like um, instrumentation or factory floor automation where you know, they would want a small display to be driven off of the device, so there would be multiple devices that would accomplish that purpose. The other maybe almost pervasive trend that we've seen is in the domains of safety and security that I'll touch upon briefly. Um, um, security you know, started originally for FPGAs as you know, in domains like defense, uh, which was critical for many applications there. But you know, it's becoming a lot more pervasive. Many of you probably heard um, uh, or, or read news around cars being hacked into. So in some of our automotive applications, as an example, we've had um, you know, uh, critical demand for security and safety uh, processing. So to address these challenges, um, uh, we've actually stepped up the capabilities of the device that we have uh, introduced at 16 nanometer, and that's the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC device. Um, I'm going to talk through each of the boxes that you see on the screen, uh, which have details about the CPUs, the IOs, you know, power management, security, safety, what we've done in the fabric to accelerate the FPGA, and also talk a little bit about you know, how it all comes together in software. 
So let me start with a block diagram. Um, so up on the left top, you actually see the two CPU subsystems. Um, we have apps class processors, a quad A53 cores. We also have uh, dual R5 cores um, in, in, in this, in this uh, device. We have a uh, GPU that includes uh, ARM uh, Mali 400 MP2. Uh, we have a you know, security and safety management system, a platform management system, which includes power management, which is pretty unique to this generation of FPGAs. The DDR system services uh, you know, pretty much most modern DDR standards, including LP4. Um, we also integrated transceivers right into the processor subsystem, so you don't have to um, you know, get that done inside a hardware programmable paradigm inside the fabric. And then within the programmable logic, a number of enhancements, of course, performance per watt, always uh, a big ticket item so that you'll see some stuff that improves that as well. And for the first time, we're also introducing a hardened codec into the programmable logic that does H.265. Um, so pretty capable device. So I'm going to step through each of these uh, in, in a little bit of detail. So first, let me start with the apps processor subsystem. Um, the apps processor subsystem is uh, built on top of 64-bit quad A53 cores. Uh, they are each capable of running at 1.5 gigahertz. Um, supports virtualization, uh, enables uh, you know an entirely different class of applications relative to our first generation SOC. In terms of pure CPU performance, we uh, believe this device offers nearly three times the CPU performance that our first generation SOC has offered. Um, we also put in significant effort to make sure that any uh, applications that are implemented on the processor subsystem and applications that are implemented in the programmable logic actually can coherently work across that interface. So you'll see a little bit more detail on that. We've also, for the first time in what we believe for FPGAs anyways, uh, implemented uh, pretty uh, extensive amount of power management, including the ability to power gate, uh, which is a pretty unique thing for FPGAs. So uh, all the A53s, uh, the L2s, uh, if you're not using them, can individually power, be power gated. Um, next, we have introduced to make the real-time experience a lot better for certain classes of uh, markets, uh, the R5 CPU cores. Um, the R5 CPU cores are actually, there's two of them. Um, you can use them individually, but also there is a capability to lockstep them, and that is significant for certain applications like safety, where you can do redundant computations that get checked for correctness or resilience, or, and, and offer resilience uh, to manage errors. Um, we've continued the trend of having tightly coupled on-chip memory. We've introduced that both um, in the, pretty close to the R5 subsystem, but also as a whole on the processor subsystem, we have an OCM. Um, the R5s can go up to 600 megahertz, so they're pretty capable devices or, or processors themselves. Um, you know, uh, so if you, if you can actually partition your code, even if you don't necessarily have real-time uh, needs to actually run uh, significant chunks on the R5. Um, if you see a little bit closer on this picture, um, there's a low power subsystem and a full power subsystem, and each of them can be independently power managed. So you can actually turn one off um, if you do not use them. The memory subsystem, um, this also has seen a significant uptick in terms of capability. Compared to the first generation SOC, we believe we are able to deliver almost four and a half times the DDR bandwidth. Um, the, the, the memory performance is capable of going up to 2,400 Mbps. Um, and um, you know, we have uh, a unique QoS management capability that's able to manage different traffic classes. Next, I'm going to touch base briefly on uh, um, the core interconnect architecture as well as the I.O. interfaces. So within the core um, uh, I.O. and sorry, within the core interconnect architecture, one of the places we spend a lot of energy on is how do you tightly integrate the processor subsystem and the programmable logic? So that interface has become significantly more capable in this generation. We actually have 128-bit uh, uh, wide interfaces that are able to offer nearly 80 plus gigabits per second per port, and we have six of them. We also have coherent ports like I talked about. Um, so if you have applications that want to snoop on each other's you know, local caches, we have capability that assures that that would work fine. <clears throat> um, uh, on the IOs, within the processor subsystem itself, you have capable transceivers that are capable of going up to six gig. 
So, and they are multifunction. They can do USB, SATA, DisplayPort, and PCIe. Uh, you can get a BI4 uh, PCIe implemented right inside the process subsystem. So, uh, very easy to use, very lightweight, and offers use model that was not available before. Um, in terms of the graphics and video functionality, the uh, three distinct pieces of information there are, you know, we have a display driver right off of it. It's display port. Um, we have a GPU that you can use to build overlays and things like that for, uh, uh, for applications like human-machine interface. Um, it's pretty capable GPU for that class of applications, uh, capable of running up to 667 megahertz. Um, power management, I touched upon this briefly. Um, the whole device actually has a you know, mode where you can run it off of battery for things like real-time control. Um, you have a low power subsystem that includes you know, um, the R5 cluster and uh, some peripherals that are critical for lower power. You can go in that mode as low as 35 milliwatts that enables certain applications uh, you know, like you know, uh, in, in, in the maybe handheld radio type of space. Um, we also have a full power domain, which is, of course, the heavyweight apps processors, the DDR system, or all of them sitting under there. Um, uh, the areas of security and safety is where I think this device has a significant set of new capabilities. For those that may not be familiar with what safety is, functional safety is you know, the set of capabilities that allow the device to uh, operate correctly to its inputs. Uh, in other words, if you have an error, either due to a systematic design bug or it's also maybe due to a hardware transient fault or a stuck at fault or some other uh, hardware error, the device is expected to have certain resilience to that. Um, as an example, I briefly mentioned that we have dual R5 processors which actually can operate in lockstep and um, actually one processor trails the other processor by a, you know, uh, some number of cycles and uh, you have some checking logic to ensure that the processors actually compute the same answer. If not, there is an error checking system that kicks in and is capable of taking evasive action. And so that sort of capability is implemented you know, across the whole device. Um, we have other things like triple redundancy that's built in and sprinkled into the whole uh, fabric. Um, security, again, is, is, is critical for a number of markets. Uh, we have up-leveled that. Um, I won't touch upon all the functionality, but you know, stuff like DPA is uh, built into this. Uh, DPA, you know, in the short form for differential power analysis, where people can actually stick a meter monitoring the power signature of your device and actually do um, sophisticated signal processing to hack into the device. So we have mechanisms to counter that that are built right into hardware. Um, in terms of the fabric, um, obviously we take advantage of what FinFETs offer, but you know, I won't get through all the builds here, but fundamentally if you look at you know, what we are able to do relative to our 28 nanometer offering, we believe we are able to offer nearly 2.4x performance per watt. A lot of it comes from process scaling. We are able to step down the voltages that which uh, we are able to offer the device but also due to a lot of the architectural innovation that has gone into the fabric. Um, a couple of uh, you know, areas where there's been significant innovation inside the fabric is around clocking and what we're able to do to push performance. Um, what you see on this slide is you know, traditionally what was done in a lot of ASIC class design. Um, we have the ability to do time borrowing um, at a pretty fine scale from uh, a granularity of nearly tens of picoseconds, maybe um, to up to a half a nanosecond type of thing. So we have programmable delay clock buffers that you can use, and our software automatically does that uh, as well, moves uh, slack times across critical paths to be able to optimize the design uh, more than what you could do without this functionality. And the chart that you see at the bottom right <clears throat> is a representation of what this capability can do eventually for the customer. Uh, we ran about 150 customer benchmarks, and uh, you can see as much as 10 to 12 percent additional performance can be delivered by leveraging this capability. The next capability that is also worth uh, highlighting is the fact that we have uh, built in um, some additional pipelining capabilities. So uh, Vivado is our place and route and implementation software cockpit. So within the software, we are able to identify you know, where you can insert pipelines automatically. And um, uh, with that capability, we are able to push design performance to levels that we couldn't do otherwise. 
as an example, you can see that you know, for a reasonably you know, uh, uh, complex design, we are able to get nearly 800 plus megahertz performance, which is you know, quite remarkable for, uh, for, for, for this level of capability in these devices. The other significant innovation um, is <clears throat> in memory. Um, if you looked at the hierarchy of memory needs that applications uh, uh, have uh, you know, in, in, in FPGAs, you have you know, the needs for pretty small little memory blocks that are sprinkled right over the fabric. That's what you see on the uh, left there on your screen. And then you have, you know, at the end of the spectrum, you can actually go to external memory and, uh, and, and bring in uh, data from there. Um, we also have block RAM, uh, which has become richer and richer with every subsequent generation of FPGAs over the past, I would say, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, but block RAMs typically uh, stop around tens of megabits. And, you know, at the end of your memory hierarchy, when you're able to go outside, you can actually go to hundreds of megabits to gigabits. So we kind of had this gap in terms of capability between the tens of megabits to the gigabits. So we've introduced uh, a new memory structure called Ultra RAM which is a dense memory that you can sprinkle right into your fabric, and, um, and, and that gets you to uh, close to 400 megabits of memory in our larger devices. So it offers a, um, uh, a technology that basically fills a gap that currently existed in our devices. <clears throat> so stepping back maybe just a little bit, you know, in summary relative to 28 nanometer, a lot of vectors have seen significant advantages. Um, you know, uh, above and uh, every, above all, probably the performance per watt metric has improved significantly, maybe about 2.4x relative to our 28th generation. Um, but the chart on the right is, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's a big step up because of Ultra RAM. Uh, we offer a lot more memory uh, right on the device. And finally, I'd like to make. Uh, comment on the hardware side on uh, transceivers. So um, transceivers tend to be, of course, you know, very popular with uh, virtually all of our devices. Relative to our Zinc 7000, which is our first generation SOC, where we had the ability to build transceivers, but you needed to do them in the hardware programmable logic, um, we actually had only one transceiver that you can get in that generation. Related to that, in this generation, we actually have the ability to get multiple transceivers, depending on the part that, uh, um, that is selected. Um, at the lowest end is transceivers that are built right into the processor subsystem. They can do six gigabits per second, as you uh, saw in terms of uh, various protocols, but also all the way up to 32 gig transceiver capability that's there sprinkled in the entire family. So pretty capable transceivers. We also looked at areas where we can get further bomb reduction and introduce capabilities. Uh, a big one is fractional PLLs that lets you derive stuff, uh, uh, specific clocking, without uh, additional components that we needed previously. So that's maybe a, a pretty big, you know, uh, quick tour of how uh, the hardware looks. But you know, if, I, if you remember going back to the beginning of my presentation, you know, one of the big goals for this whole effort was not just you know, to build more capable hardware, but how do you actually allow software to be easily um, programmed, and you know, how do we make these devices uh, more usable? So that's where I'm going to touch upon the remaining, uh, uh, in, the, in the remaining piece of my presentation, uh, the software tools and environments that we offer. So, um, you know, of course, with any of uh, a processing cluster or a processing architecture, you need to offer a lot of system software. So Xilinx does offer it together with the ecosystem, things like boot, bootloaders, um, you know, uh, for, the, for the functionality that's in this device, which is heterogeneous multiprocessing, we have environments that allow you to manage interprocessor communication, and uh, we offer stacks for those. Uh, we also have an integrated SDK, which is you know, a software design environment where you can do um, not only do your design, but also um, uh, you know, uh, the capabilities of the system allows you to you know, debug, profile, and you know, do build traces and uh, uh, do performance analysis and improvements in your whole system. Um, at this time, the device has been taped out, and we have a number of uh, software and systems running on a variety of platforms. What you see on the bottom left there is uh, an emulation system that's actually, you know, no surprise, built on, on top of Xilinx FPGAs. There are six large FPGAs that are actually emulating this device. 
Um, on top, unfortunately, it's not as readable, but you know, you actually see Linux with the uh, demonstration to be able to uh, bring down a CPU. On the right, you actually see Zen um, hypervisor system, which allows multiple operating system hosts to run on this hardware, and you actually see Doom being run there. So pretty capable um, for an FPGA, if you will, right, uh, that it offers all this kind of processing power and capabilities. But probably the most significant software innovation that we actually announced earlier this year, and for the first time we are sharing more technical detail at this conference, is what we call as the SDSOC development environment. This environment actually offers the opportunity to write C code and the entire design implementation is managed by the software. So whatever needs to run on the processor subsystem, obviously, you know, C code runs there, but also if you need to accelerate some pieces of that C code and build custom hardware that runs on the programmable logic, that thing is directly inferred and automatically synthesized and put together, including all the communication infrastructure, et cetera, that is required to get the design done. So that's what SDSOC is. You know, our goal is to create an ASSP-like programming experience. Um, the big difference between ASSPs and us is, you know, how much hardware do you need to know or how much hardware do you need to really understand to program the device. Uh, our goal, as you'll see with a little example at the back, is to, um, uh, to, to, to really get this done through a single click experience. How does this uh, system work? We actually take C code. There's an ability to profile the design, specify which functions need to be accelerated. We have libraries built for various applications like Vision that these C functions can be mapped towards. Um, and then the system decides what needs to run on the processing system that goes through a standard maybe ARM or some other compiler tool chain, gets compiled for the processors. And then on the other side, what needs to be accelerated goes through a high-level synthesis paradigm actually the hardware design gets created, and all the stuff that needs to work in between them, uh, things like DMAs, data movement, uh, data consistency, is automatically generated for the end user. Um, um, so, so, so the system allows two types of usage. You actually can target hardware uh, without really having hardware, so you can take your C code and really figure out how best to optimize what are your profiling uh, pain points, and then figure out which pieces of hardware that you need to uh, accelerate and what can run on in software. And uh, it also has capabilities to collect automated measurements. Once you hook it to a board, it will come back with display saying, here is your hotspot, here is how much acceleration you're getting, and so on. As an example of the capability, um, there is a motion detection application that is shown here. The code is rather simple. Um, what this application is trying to do is, uh, you know, trying to estimate, uh, you know, how, how the image is moving. Um, all the stuff that you see on the blue is what we offer as a platform, so it's not something that the user needs to build. And all the stuff in the red is what is automatically derived by the software. So um, the code is actually, if you read it, you know, it's actually grabbing an image. So that's what your get camera says, and A is a memory pointer. Um, the Sobel is actually uh, an edge detection algorithm that detects the edge for, an, for, 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 uh, for, for this application. You actually do it twice, um, and, and then you do a diff and do some filtering, and then you put it back into memory, and the display functions then take over. So, and this runs in, a, in, a, in a some kind of a control loop. So it's pretty um, neat and uh, exciting capability. You can actually do a lot of uh, interesting high-level applications relatively quickly and turn these around, and that's been a, uh, a very positive experience from the early customers that this tool has been in use with. So that's maybe the last slide that I have. In summary, I think you know, I am I'm, uh, very excited to have shared this information about our uh, second generation SOC, which is uh, built on top of 16 nanometer FinFET technology. Um, as you can see, we've been able to offer you know, a huge leap, both in CPU performance, memory performance, performance per watt. And not all of this is coming from process scaling. Um, so we've been able to go beyond process scaling to be able to deliver something uh, significant. The device has been taped out on, uh, TS onto TSMC uh, 16FF plus process. Uh, and a, a lot of software and systems are running uh, on very platforms today. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Vamsi. We have time for perhaps just one or two quick questions. If you come up to the microphone, state your name and affiliation. Okay, we're still warming up this morning. Perhaps <laughs> I have a quick question. Can sure. you give us an understanding of what the uh, price ranges of these devices would be? Okay, so uh, maybe a commercial question put me on a spot. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, we have shared a lot of public information. But, you know, one thing I can say is um, these devices uh, at the lowest end uh, offer a step up from our current 7 series, which is there is a lot of public information there, to at the very high end, they tend to be really capable devices with, you know, hundreds of thousands of logic cells. So I would say there's a pretty broad spectrum. Um, at the very lowest end, pretty comparable, uh, maybe a little step up from our current 7 series devices. But, you know, on the very high end, they, you know, they sort of map into more capable FPGAs. So I haven't given you an exact answer, yeah. but... <laughs> Hi, my name is Gil. Um, did I hear you correctly? And you said that you can take straight and CC and, and uh, synthesize it to FPGAs? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, do we did, support the entire... No, did you uh, say that you're taking straight and CC and synthesizing those blocks? Yeah. Um, so let me qualify that. You know, of course, you know, um, all all of C, of course, you know, syntactically can be sucked into the tool. But you know, what can be truly synthesized is, you know, there is a set of pragmas that you need to guide the tool as well, and and, and there is a subset uh, of functions that can be uh, uh, implemented. So, so it can take in all of the syntactic richness, but what can actually be mapped to hardware, you need to know what can actually be mapped to hardware. So for instance, um, let's say this demo which you showed, the edge detection, was yeah. Sobel, was, were any of those blocks specified in C and synthesized? Yes, that's correct, they were specified in C. And you can actually uh, download libraries for those sort of things. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Vamsi. And uh, um, we're moving on to the next presentation. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Mike Hutton from Altera. Uh, Mike uh, is an IC design architect at Altera. He's also the principal investigator in Altera's technology office. Uh, he's responsible for all product architecture definition, including the Stratix 10 family, which he's going to uh, talk about today. Uh, Mike's received his undergrad degrees from the University of Waterloo in Canada and his uh, PhD from the University of Toronto in Canada, where Mike and I actually were uh, uh, studied together at the same time, so I've, he's a very close, close friend of mine. Um, Mike uh, uh, has worked prior to Altera at IBM, Northern Telecom, and uh, in between also worked at an FPGA startup uh, company called Tabula before returning to Altera. His primary interests are involving FPGA CAD, uh, FPGA architecture, hybrid FPGA architecture, so the combination of processors and FPGAs, um, SEU, um, Mike, uh, Mike has uh, 35 uh, academic publications and he's a holder of uh, over 80 uh, issued patents. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, so I I'm going to talk about the uh, Stratix 10 FPGA, which is our, our new FPGA offering at 14 nanometer uh, using Intel's technology. And uh, last year we talked about the ARIA 10 FPGA, which is a mid-range device and concentrated mostly on the SOC aspects and the transceivers. Today I'm going to be talking more about uh, fabric architecture and some of the blocks uh, with the goal of uh, showing you how we got to the performance levels that we're targeting. Uh, of course, I'm presenting this, but there are a large number of people that were involved in the early architecture development uh, for Stratix 10. Uh, this is a list of them. I'm obviously not going to name them all. Uh, the big rocks in uh, Stratix 10, uh, fundamentally, we're going after performance. Uh, our goal is to get to 2x the performance of the Stratix 5 family, which is our 28 nanometer high-end devices. And because we want to go at this performance, we have to make sure that we can make it feasible within what we can do in the package uh, and the die. Uh, so we want to target about 70% lower power than the 28 nanometer offerings. Uh, another big rock is the use of two, uh, of 2.5D or 3D uh, system and package integration. We are going to separate out the way that we do the transceivers and the analog die from the die which do the core fabric architecture. Uh, obviously, uh, adopting Intel's 14 nanometer trigate uh, was important to us in getting to both the performance and power benefits. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, a modification to the way that the FPGA is programmed, so the configuration methodology 
that we use to instantiate a bitstream onto the FPJ uh, and, uh, and make the FPJ programmable. So uh, just as, as, a, as a starting point, going through the block diagram of how the device is built, uh, so this, this particular uh, system is shown with uh, seven different die. There's the FPGA die, the core, which is the LUTs, flops, uh, memories, and DSP blocks. And then the transceiver and the transceiver-related interface protocols are implemented on a separate die. Uh, and then these are connected together by the uh, Intel's uh, embedded memory bridge. A second thing I'm going to talk about is the scalable sector architecture. Uh, as FPGAs get larger and larger, it becomes harder to talk about verifying and building uh, 4 million, 5 million LEs worth of logic. So we made a, a change in the way that we assemble the devices. And essentially, we're building little mini FPGAs and stitching them together. This is what we call sector architecture. And then in the seams in between these sectors, we're going to run the clocks, and we're going to make the clock network all programmable. And uh, we're also going to run a network on chip, an embedded NOC, uh, which is part of the configuration subsystem when I talk about that. Uh, in terms of core performance, we are getting some advantage from the process, but the majority of the performance benefit we're getting is going to come from changes to the fabric architecture. And these are specifically related around this uh, graphic shown in the center, uh, which is uh, what we call the Hyperflex uh, routing multiplexer. And this is uh, really changing the way that FPGA fabric architecture is built to allow uh, basically unlimited amounts of pipelining without the use of additional resources in the FPGA fabric. Uh, in order to get to 1 gigahertz, which is what I promised on the first slide, uh, we have to make the hard blocks uh, go to 1 gigahertz. So the DSP block will uh, be operating at 1 gigahertz for fixed point operation. It runs at 750 megahertz for the floating point operators. Uh, and the uh, M20K block, which is the block RAM, uh, will run at 1 gigahertz. And finally, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the SOC, but there is uh, a quad core A53 which is embedded onto the FPJ fabric. Uh, this is going to run at 1.5 gigahertz for each of the four cores. Uh, and then we have hardened DDR controllers. Uh, some of them work directly with the, uh, with the arm, and some of them are available for DDR access from the fabric itself. And then the little uh, light blue block up at the top is the secure device manager, which is the processor that manages the configuration of the device. And I'll talk about that again in a couple slides. So uh, first, the 2.5D interfacing. Uh, so we start with the core fabric architecture. And you can see on the, uh, on the bottom uh, a picture of the fabric die, and on the top, the buildup of the package. The tile that implements the transceivers uh, in, is architected to have 24 transceivers. And then the hard PCI Express block uh, is integrated on with that, along with some other things like the 3-volt IOs. We then tile, in this case, uh, in this particular device, six of these. And then we connect them together with the uh, Intel embedded memory uh, bridge. And that it, uh, forms a little trench into the substrate of the package and allows just the 2.5D uh, the interconnect consists only of the bridge required to connect the, the, the micro bumps on the transceiver die to the micro bumps on the uh, FPJ fabric die. And then, of course, you put the lid on top of it, and you have an SLC uh, multi-die package uh, that functions just like a monolithic FPGA would. So uh, a little bit of the uh, benefits of using EMIB technology over some of the other possibilities that we have for doing 2.5D integration. Uh, one is uh, we have reduced complexity relative to an interposer. We only have to deal with a relatively small die. That does, we don't have to deal with uh, a full interposer or a full radical size die for the interposer. Uh, this allows us to do some very nice risk mitigation things uh, in terms of building the FPJ. We can decouple the analog development from the digital development of the FPJ fabric. Uh, this means that we can choose to use uh, a variant of the process technology if we want to on building the transceivers. It also means that we can take out one transceiver and put in a different kind of transceiver uh, if we want to build a different derivative for the device. Uh, it, it also uh, allows us to build, I guess, what you could call non-rectangular devices. So shown on the, on the right-hand side here, we can build that same die and put only four transceiver tiles onto that uh, package, building a device which has fewer transceivers. But of course, then we don't have to pay for those extra transceivers in building the device. 
Otherwise, we would have to sell that device, and then people would use only two-thirds of the transceivers. Uh, and this allows us, as I said, to build, uh, uh, basically mixing up tick and talk. Uh, we can build a new transceiver without building a new FPJ architecture. We can build a new FPJ architecture without building a new transceiver. And this includes uh, putting out future uh, transceiver technologies, such as the 56 gig transceivers. We can do that without building a new core die if we don't want to. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the configuration subsystem. Uh, configuration, uh, the, 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 the programming on FPJ is basically just one big SRAM array. And those, uh, those SRAMs, which we, which we call configuration RAMs, are what is used to program the, the mul routing multiplexers, the, the LUTs, and the other uh, parts of the device that need to be programmed. Uh, it, it started out as being a very simple shift register. You would just shift data into the data register and then thunk it into uh, one particular frame of the configuration. You would do this until you've programmed all the frames in the device. As chips get bigger and bigger and bigger, the size of the data register grows, and the distance, logically, from the data register to the frames grows. And this makes it harder to deal with timing, uh, with, with margin on the, on the CRAM. And this is one of the things that drove us to uh, making some changes to the configuration system. We also want to add a lot of complexity, uh, complexity in a good sense, a new functionality to configuration. So configuration is no longer just a shift register. We want to encrypt the data. We want to uh, be able to authenticate it. We want to do compression of the bit stream. We want to modify the compression algorithms when we come up with a new idea. Uh, there's security. Uh, we want to put in things like puffs. Uh, we want to do SEU. Uh, scrubbing, uh, and we want to protect against side channel attacks, and we want to manage things like partial reconfiguration. As well, the configuration subsystem does things like debug, uh, so managing to make sure that the CRAM uh, integrity is still, is still present. So our solution is to move it to software. And this is an overview of the configuration subsystem. So uh, shown on the left down here is uh, the physical die. So here's the, the ARM processor. And here is the secure device manager responsible for configuring the device. Over here is a logical diagram. The SDM is a, a, a lockstep triplicated processor, and this is for uh, safety and security reasons. And it is responsible for getting the bitstream from off chip. So regardless of what mechanism you use to bring the bitstream onto the chip, whether it be through uh, something like PCI Express or simple JTAG or configuration pins, it goes through the SDM, which is responsible for all this security uh, and decryption. And then it packetizes and sends the, the configuration bitstream over the configuration network on chip, which is in these seams between the sectors. Inside every sector, we have a very small uh, processor. And that, that processor's job is to manage everything uh, to do with the life of that mini chip or sector. So this includes uh, programming the device. It includes managing partial reconfiguration. And uh, it includes things like the uh, uh, SEU integrity checks to check that the CRAM bits have not been flipped uh, by soft errors. And by doing this, fundamentally what we build is a composable system. We can do verification of a single sector by wrapping a test bench around it, uh, which helps us to build the devices. Uh, we know that the timing is always the same in a sector, regardless of where that sector is placed. And the operation of configuration is now using a uh, software-based methodology we can improve the features of the SDM or the LSM at a later date by, by updating the, the ROM code. And this, we, we really feel this is a kind of a leap forward to the next generation of how FPJs are programmed. Uh, it, it's going to allow us to add all kinds of new features into uh, configuration over the course of time. Uh, a brief mention on the, uh, the ARMA53 processor. This is just a block diagram. Uh, it is a 1.5 gigahertz quad core uh, ARM processor, uh, the A53. Uh, we've added a couple of new features to this since the ARIA 10 device. So there's a cache coherency unit, which is going to make sure that uh, the FPGA fabric and uh, the processor are cache coherent. And this uh, makes it a lot easier for the programmer to develop some types of applications. And it's fully integrated with the SDM. Uh, even though I've shown them far apart, they share a fair number of peripherals. So the SDM can use some of those peripherals that belong to the HPS uh, when it's doing uh, configuration and other tasks. Uh, the last piece of the, uh, of the chip buildup is to talk about the clocking. Uh, clocks are, uh, as we want to get to higher and higher performances, clocks, clock skew, clock uncertainty becomes a bigger and bigger part of the budget. If you want to run at a gigahertz and you've got 
100 or 200 picoseconds of clock skew or clock uncertainty, it's basically untenable. You, you can't get to there. So uh, what we've done is we've made the clock networks be routable. Instead of having a global clock spine, which generates a pre-programmed H-tree, which is how most previous FPJs were built, uh, we are going to route the clocks in the seams, and they're all programmable. So this is, you could choose to build an H-tree, but you can also choose to build a clock in the green uh, piece right down here, and then choose to build a different clock in the red, and this would use the same logical clock. So if the chip has 32 clocks, those could both be clock number one because they're separated from each other uh, by the programming of the clock tree. Uh, this allows us to, first of all, build a lot more clocks, but it allows to also give software the flexibility to generate the clocks the way that it sees fit. So if it wants to generate a clock as, a, as an H tree with balance, it can do that. If it wants to generate a fishbone with beneficial skew because it knows that the data path is going in a certain direction, then the software can choose to generate the clock in that way. Uh, and this is going to give us a lot of benefit in uh, managing the core performance by being able to control the clocks. Uh, a brief mention of the core building blocks. Uh, these did not change all that much from ARIA 10 to Stratix 10. Most of the fabric architecture changes are going to be in the routing. So we continue to have the adaptive logic module, which is uh, a six input, which can be fractured into multiple five inputs, and so on. Uh, the major change in the M20K block is that it uh, will now run at a gigahertz, which is an in increase in the speed. And this is basically just designing it to run at a higher Fmax. We wouldn't have done that before because the fabric doesn't run that speed. But we're going to make the fabric be capable of running a gigahertz. So to keep up, we have to make the hard blocks run at the same speed. Similarly, the DSP will retain the hard floating point that we talked about last year and will be optimized to run uh, at a gigahertz uh, th through, the through the addition of an initial pipeline register. Uh, and we can, with the device with the most DSP, we can hit 10 teraflops. We have something like 11 to 12,000 DSP uh, floating point operations, and they're running at 750 megahertz. So we will be able to program uh, this Stratix 10 FPJ to run at 10 teraflops. The uh, labs, clusters, and routing all look basically the same. We do tweak uh, the lengths of the wires and the flexibility of the routing architecture, but fundamentally, uh, it's not all that much different for the, from ARIA 10. And similarly, the, the basic structure of the input and output of the routing to the lab is not changed very much. What is changed is the consideration of flip-flops uh, in the fabric. Uh, FPJs historically talk about a logic block as being a LUT with a flip-flop. So a flip-flop is a logic resource. A LUT is a logic resource. They're roughly tiled in a one-to-one -one ratio, at least in early FPGAs. When you bring the fracturable uh, ALMs into play, you can have two flops or four flops with the fracturable ALM. But fundamentally, a flop is a logic resource, and it comes out of the user's RTL. And what does this mean? This means as people try to pipeline their devices more and more, uh, their designs more and more, as they add pipeline stages to run at higher performance, they start running out of logic cells. They start using logic cells as feed-throughs to get at the flip-flops that they want to pipeline the device. So our solution to this is to rethink the way that registers are treated in the design of the FPGA. And they are treated as routing, not as, uh, as logic. So every routing mux in the FPGA will get an additional flop, basically 10xing or 20xing the number of flip-flops that exist in the device now, you're not going to use all of them, but they're there everywhere to use. And I'll show some more on that. Uh, the Trigate process gives us uh, most of the power benefit. So FinFET is uh, a great way to get better power. Uh, we are also going to add a couple of additional features. We're going to target uh, different voltages, and we're going to extend the use of voltage IDs uh, to recover static power as we bend the devices into different speed grades. And I am going to talk a little bit about Hyperflex for power reduction because when you can increase speed, you can turn that into a power reduction. And our goal is to hit 50 to 70% lower power per function and do this without slowing down the FPGA. So to introduce uh, Hyperflex, first I want to talk about how you do retiming in a conventional FPGA. So this is a little toy path. So I've got uh, a register to register path. And in this case, I've got one path that's one and a half nanoseconds, one path that's three and a half nanoseconds. Of course, the critical path here is the three and a half nanoseconds. I have an unbalanced path. I might want to turn on retiming in the software, which will move that flop from here down to here. 
and attempt to balance these two paths. This is a standard retiming in CAD software. Uh, this allows me to get, in this case, a 16% uh, Fmax gain, but it adds area. I, I'm consuming this an, an empty LUT to get at this flop. I'm also consuming routing resources to go into the lab that contains that LUT and then back out of it again. Similarly, if I add pipelining, so now I've changed the design. I've added an extra tick of latency, so of course I'm going to get better performance. In this case, 1.5, 1.5, and 2.5. And and so now I have a 40% Fmax gain over the original design, but I've still added that additional area, and I've added a clock tick. And basically, we want to allow people to do this, but without spending that area and uh, an unnecessary delay. So Hyperflex consists, uh, this is a, a typical uh, FPGA, a previous FPGA, where you would exit a routing wire, go into a lab, go through the LUT, pick up the flop, and then come back out onto the routing wire. This is the way that you would have uh, pipelining in your routing. What we're going to do is every routing MUX in the device is going to have this structure right here. So following the routing MUX, which we call a driver input MUX, so this exists in all FPGAs, uh, we're going to add a flip-flop, which is optionally used. So th that second uh, two-to-one MUX says you can either use the flop or not use the flop. And these exist everywhere. Every routing MUX in the device has one of these structures which allows you to, to be registered or unregistered. And why do we want to do this? We want to unlock uh, retiming and uh, pipelining. So you can get perfect balance. Why can you get better balance than before? Well, the, the, the delay of a typical routing wire is something in the neighborhood of 100 to 150 picoseconds, which means you can choose the location of that routing mux, uh, or that flip-flop on the routing mux, to a granularity of something like 100 picoseconds. The software is very simple. You just push the register forward or backwards into the routing architecture. We don't waste these logic elements, uh, burning LUTs to be feed-throughs, and we don't waste routing to go in and out of labs that we don't otherwise need to. Moving a register in Hyperflex consists of taking this register, uh, which was originally here, uh, because this routing MUX is programmed to, to listen to the registered output, reprogramming that routing MUX to a zero, and turning on the routing MUX in the, uh, in the routing, uh, turning on the, the flip-flop in the routing MUX. And this basically just moves that register forward or backward in time as is necessary to balance the critical paths. And Cordis will do this for you, and there's always a routing MUX there because every, uh, uh, there's always a flip-flop there because every routing MUX has one. So now what, is, uh, what does retiming look like in a Stratix 10 architecture? So before, we had that same example that I used before. We have unbalanced critical paths with 1.5 nanoseconds and 3.5 nanoseconds. Now when I want to do retiming, all I do is turn off the flop here and turn the one on in the routing. I'm going to get a 40% Fmax gain, and the, the illustration here is because, because I can choose exactly the right location on that routing path to get the flip-flop, I can balance it perfectly, and as a result, I can get a perfect balance between the 2.5 nanoseconds on either side. So I've used the same resources. All I've done is turn on one of the uh, routing flip-flops. And then for pipelining, if the designer goes back and says, I want to do better, I want to improve the performance of this design, and I'm willing to give up a tick of latency to do so, they can go back and add uh, a flip-flop to their RTL, and then they will keep the original flip-flop. One of these flip-flops will be created out in the routing fabric, and they'll balance to 1.5 and 1.75 nanoseconds. And you can see in this illustration, this is how you're going to get to something like uh, 2x uh, performance. So we're not trying to say that you get 2x the speed of an RC line, and we're not trying to say you get 2x the, or half the delay going through a routing mux. The, the fundamental benefit to the designer is for most FPGA designs, where you're willing to pipeline, where, you're all, wait, where what you care about is throughput, you can add these registers, and they're free from the designer's point of view. They don't have to consume logic resources uh, to be created. Uh, in order to enable this, we have to make some changes to the software. So the software is going to add a new step. For, for people familiar with FPGA uh, software, it, it runs pretty much a similar uh, uh, flow to, to ASIC CAD. So map or synthesis followed by fitting or place and route, followed by static timing analysis. We add a new step after the fitting, which is place and route, which moves these registers around. So this is essentially retiming, but it's a less complex form of retiming. This is not executing a full Bellman Ford algorithm with all kinds of complications. We're just moving registers back and forth along a wire in order to balance the critical path delays. But we can also do a, a lot of things that are very interesting. We, we want to change the definition of time enclosure. Instead of the FPGA software tool telling you your critical path is from register A to register B, now it's going to say your critical clock domain is clock domain A. 
It has a, a total latency of three and a half nanoseconds. It has three flops. Therefore, the best I'm going to be able to do is three and a half nanoseconds divided by three flops. If you give me more flops here, I can meet your timing constraints. And then the designer can go back and add those flops at the beginning, at the end, in the middle, wherever it's convenient in that RTL, and then they'll be moved around by the CAD software. And the other thing that the CAD software is going to do is it's going to change its definition of what is critical. In a traditional FPJ software flow, uh, and I'm representing delay by distance here, uh, you've got these two critical paths are both the same distance. So the software is going to see that, and it's going to say these are the same. They're, they're equally worthy of optimization. Because the software knows about retiming and hyperflex, it knows that this path is actually from here to here with five flops, and this one is from here to here with three flops. And that's a different uh, result. And it's going to concentrate on the design uh, path that has less ability to do retiming. So our, our advice to designers uh, to use this kind of a system is to hyper-pipeline hyper your data path so that you can get a very strong high-performance data path and then to optimize your control logic by doing things like going back, optimizing your state machines to uh, remove loops. Because of course, the, you can't retime through a loop. So the designer has to do operations that optimize the loops. Uh, a couple of comments on power. So our goal is half the power per function. And the majority of this is not architectural. It comes from uh, the process. VinFed is a naturally lower, process, no, lower power process. Uh, it does allow us to take more benefit of the process as a power reduction. Because we have HyperFlex to improve performance opt, uh, architecturally, we can choose to use more of the process dividend uh, to reduce power. Uh, we've expanded VID, as I mentioned before, and we've added more power management. Uh, all of the hard blocks that aren't used on the device are power gated to reduce static power. Adding registers helps as well. By not consuming those extra logic resources, you can reduce the, the footprint of the device, and this saves power. But the real prize is when you can take a design that was running 256 megahertz and make it run 512 megahertz. Because if you want to run that same design and you're able to get to twice the speed, you can fold that data path in half, or you can double pump those DSP blocks, and you can get that design to run at half the, the size. This is a benefit in terms of cost, but it's also a benefit in terms of power. Because for the most part, running twice as fast with half the resources is power neutral for, for dynamic power. But your device is half the size, so you're saving half of your static power when you're able to do that. And, and we feel this is really the, the prize that you get uh, from designing for the higher performance. So uh, showing some of these area power trade-offs. So this is starting with a Stratix 5 device. This is, uh, so the, the static power is shown at 100 degrees C, because in architecture, we only look at the worst case. Uh, so this is the Stratix 5 for a typical design, uh, dynamic power, AC power, IO power. The, the AC is this whole part right here. If you take that same design and you migrate it untouched to Stratix 10, you don't try to change the performance, you can get to this power chart right here. Uh, this is mainly taking advantage of the process and a little bit of hyperflex to balance things around. If you take it and you run at half the width but twice the fmax, you additionally get to cut your, your, your static power in half. And alternatively, what you can do is instead of running at half the width and twice the fmax, you can run at 2x the fmax by the same width. And now, of course, you're doing twice the work, but with uh, comparable power, in fact, a power reduction from Stratix 5. So in summary, just some of the main points that I was trying to make. 3D integration isn't just about integrating multiple things onto the same die. It's about de-risking the way that we build FPGAs. It's about making sure that we can target the process to analog when we want to target analog, to digital when we want to target digital, and allows us to build uh, more device proliferations with fewer tapeouts, uh, which is always good. Uh, device floor planning and configuration is a, is a necessary upgrade to configuration. This allows us to get at many of the advanced features that people need in the device, uh, especially around things like uh, SEU robustness uh, and debug. Uh, the SOC integration, I didn't really talk about it, but that's because this is becoming mainstream. Uh, all of our uh, Stratix 10 devices have an SOC processor on them, uh, and we expect everybody to be using a combination of hardware and software to design with FPGAs. Pipelining unlocks a, a pile of optimizations that weren't previously there in FPGAs. We're using wires efficiently by running them at twice the uh, Fmax, but not by throwing static power at trying to make things run faster than they naturally run. The process is still giving us power benefits. Uh, 14 nanometer trigate was a, was a, a great boost uh, in terms of power efficiency. 
uh, and allowed us to get uh, higher performance without uh, needing to go to a higher power device. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Please uh, state your name and affiliation. Uh, Rick Merritt from EE Times. Uh, Mike, congratulations on a really uh, interesting and aggressive architecture, a lot of creativity there. Uh, Thanks. Apologize for the kind of somewhat off topic question, but <laughs> it's built in this 14 nanometer process of which you're sort of one of the pioneering users. So anything you can tell us about how that's going? Uh, 14 nanometers is going great. Uh, uh, I'm obviously not going to hand out any dates for you that we haven't announced publicly, uh, but we're making great progress and we're, we're very happy with the 14 nanometer process. I'm afraid I don't really have any more nuances than that. <laughs> John Jason, AMD. I um, had a question about the EMIB. Um, did you have to do anything special to deal with the differences in thermal um, expansivity between the brick chip itself, which I assume is silicon, and the package substrate? Yeah, so I'm not a packaging person, but I'm not aware of anything that we had to do special. The, the EMIB is a very small die, uh, and it, 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 it's passive. So it doesn't have any uh, constraints with respect to power. Sure, but I assume it's still silicon, right? Which... Sorry? Oh, it is still silicon, yes. Uh, but it, but it's, just, it's just wires. Okay. Can you comment on the, the pitch of the, the, the bumps connecting the, the bridge to the other chips? How close Comment you... on the picture? Uh... Yeah, so it seemed, it seemed, at least in your picture, it seemed like the bumps connecting the bridge to the other chips are smaller than the bumps coming out of the Oh, yes, those are, those are micro bumps, uh, right. the same as if you were building using COAS or other Two and a half D technology, so those those bumps are quite a bit smaller than the the bumps that are that are connecting to the uh, the the balls on the package. Okay, so it's it's roughly uh, the same pitch as. I, I don't have a quote for you. If you're asking me the size, I don't have a quote. Uh, I think it's actually the, the size of the micro bumps is listed in uh, Intel's uh, white papers on uh, the EMIB technology. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Liu with NVIDIA. Uh, I just had a question on your uh, embedded flops uh, that you're allowed to move in there. Mm -hmm. Is that available? Is that statically configured, or can you use that for DVFS retiming uh, if you want to? Th those are statically configured, okay. but you use them for retiming. The software will move your device, the, the but critical they're not, password, but they're not, they're not done. Well, they are available with partial reconfiguration. So if oh, you're okay. using partial reconfiguration using supported flows, yes. So if you're reconfiguring a portion of the device, part, part of that would be reconfiguring the, the the routing. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, okay. Great talk. Thank you. I'd like to now welcome uh, Eric Chung. Eric Chung is here from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Research in particular. Uh, Microsoft uh, is working on uh, uses for FPGAs in data centers. Uh, Eric will give us an update on the actual infrastructure, but he's going to focus on the deep learning aspects uh, of uh, using the FPGAs. Um, uh, Eric's been with Microsoft for a few years now. He received his uh, undergrad degree from UC Berkeley, so he's right here in the Bay Area. He went on and received his PhD from CMU, and then he joined uh, Microsoft. So welcome, Eric. All right. Thanks, Ralph. So good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, and attending my talk. Uh, especially want to thank the uh, program committee for putting together such a wonderful program, uh, and especially on the themes of uh, deep learning. I really enjoyed uh, the Sunday talk by uh, Roland and especially uh, the, the keynote by uh, Jan LeCun yesterday. Uh, and so today I'm actually going to talk about, well, how well do we think uh, deep learning would run uh, on production hardware uh, in the day center using uh, programmable logic. Um, before I continue, I want to first make a few acknowledgments. I want to thank uh, my team in particular, uh, Colin, Tenji, and Ju Young, who did a lot of the heavy lifting uh, in implementation and testing and verification. Uh, I also like to thank uh, Doug Berger and the rest of the Catapult team for providing the stable production platform uh, in which we can do this kind of research and investigation. I'd like to thank Trishal uh, from the Digital Cortex team, who have been our software partners in this endeavor who provided the uh, shared software infrastructure that we could build our work upon. And of course, I'd like to thank our FPJ partners uh, at Altera. Okay, 
So you've all heard by now pretty much that uh, you know, deep learning is uh, making a lot of headlines. So I'm not going to belabor on this slide uh, too much. But deep learning uh, you know, really made its mark, I think, around 2012, where we really began to see a significant advance uh, in the accuracy of, of, of classification, so uh, in computer vision. So this came out of the work of University of Toronto, a uh, huge impact, and is now uh, being widely uh, investigated in all areas of AI and computer science. Um, and you know, one, I think, significant milestone is that uh, with you know, deep learning today, uh, you can actually build algorithms that can label and classify images better than a human can. So I think that's a remarkable uh, achievement, uh, and I think uh, a significant milestone. And, and as a computer engineer, actually, with you know, not, not really a whole lot of background in machine learning, this is kind of like a magic to me. So one sort of computational motif you keep hearing about uh, in deep learning are these deep convolutional neural networks. And we heard them uh, in a number of different talks today. And so that's actually going to be uh, the main case study and focus in this talk when we refer to uh, deep learning. Deep learning, of course, encompasses a much more broader set of uh, things. But you know, this is what we're going to concentrate our efforts on. So what this talk is really about is asking the question, uh, do we think programmable specialized hardware in the form of FPJs would be a promising target uh, for, deep, uh, for deep learning uh, in the data center. And this question came about on the heels of uh, the success of the Catapult Bing pilot, which we did uh, last year and was announced at, uh, at Hot Chips, actually, by my uh, good friend uh, Andrew Putnam, where we essentially showed that using a homogenous fabric of FPGAs, we could actually speed up uh, Bing ranking a fairly non-trivial data center workload by a factor of two. And shortly on the heels of that, we began asking ourselves, well, are there other workloads of strategic value uh, that we would potentially benefit from this type of fabric? Uh, and so this is what we're aiming to, uh, to talk about today. Now, the data center is interesting because you know, we can get to scale. The key here is that we have a large set of fungible resources that we can sort of set up, we can allocate on demand for the problem that we have at task. Uh, when that problem is no longer needed, uh, we can basically reuse those resources for other applications. So, Data center has to support a very diverse set of uh, applications. This is a very different question than asking, uh, what should you do if you just wanted a platform for deep learning? And I think a lot of uh, machine learning practitioners today would say, well, I just want the biggest GPU cluster I can today. So we're asking a slightly different question here. So uh, I'm going to go over some different uh, design choices that a data center operator has, could potentially work with. Um, these aren't all of them, but these are kind of the, the big ones that we think about. And a lot of this has to do with balancing uh, specialization with uh, homogeneity and heterogeneity. The most common design point today in data centers today you'll see um, is essentially having a homogeneous uh, bed of CPU-based servers, right? And so this is kind of how we've been doing business for a long time, and, and for good reason. Um, it's very excellent for maintainability uh, in the data center. We really like to have the same what's called a hardware skew uh, for all of our different uh, applications, and so that we can fungibly scale our applications across them. We like CPU-based servers because they're general purpose, and they offer us the maximum flexibility uh, for all the workloads that we could throw at it. The problem is if we run into one of these uh, CNN-based workloads where we just really can't get the work done on CPUs fast enough, uh, we're kind of stuck, right? Or we would have to allocate uh, a, an astronomically high number of resources to achieve the same thing, which could also cost, uh, cost you a lot. So another strategy is to now make your data center heterogeneous. Okay, so you, you're going to take away some of your CPU-based servers and allocate them. Now instead, uh, spend your resources on, on putting together pools of GPUs, uh, or ASICs, if you think you know, that's a, a very uh, high-value workload for you. And this is great for the machine learning experts. Right, so the machine learning people will be very happy because you know, you've given them these awesome GPUs or ASICs that can speed up the CNNs, DNNs by factors of several orders of magnitude. Um, but there are some problems with this. Um, first is that you know, if, uh, if, if the demand is low at any given time, you have sort of a stranded capacity issue, um, that you, know, you have workloads that can't use the GPUs. Another problem is that you've broken this kind of fungibility benefit of the data center. Um, you can't, if, if, for instance, demand exceeds what you have in your limited pools, uh, you can't scale beyond that. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, you know, you know, within Microsoft, actually, you know, we do actually have pools of GPUs, and the often heard complaint is that I don't have enough of them, right? 
Um, so heterogeneity is also incredibly challenging for maintainability. So you want to have the minimum set of hardware SKUs to qualify and to verify and to test. Uh, and, and, and that's an enormous amount of investment and effort uh, that's done by our infrastructure team. Um, and so, so having a very different type of SKU to fit GPUs is actually very challenging. OK, so why not go big? So let's, let's make everything homogenous. Let's put a GPU, a high-end GPU, or ASIC into every a single server uh, in our data centers. So that's great for homogeneity uh, and maintainability. Um, we're going to be substantially increasing the cost and power per server. So GPUs on the order of hundreds of watts. So in data center, you have to provision for basically the maximum power draw of the server. Uh, and this is particularly an issue with GPUs. And it's not necessarily going to be economical for all applications in the data center. So at Microsoft, for instance, we have a very diverse range of workloads, right? That's enterprise. We have Azure. We have Bing. We have latency critical workloads. We have batch workloads. Um, there's uh, email, exchange. There, there, there are many, many, many workloads. And I would be willing to say that you know, uh, the number of those servers that would be needed to run machine learning is in, you know, for deep learning would be at most single digits percentage of, of all workloads. It's just a diverse set of workloads you have to deal with. And, and this is a worse problem for ASICs because there's a long turnaround time to actually implement a new functionality. OK. So what we did last year is we started investigating the idea of putting uh, FPGAs into some of our servers. OK, so we had a, a pilot bed with about 1,600 servers with FPGAs. Now, the F, we, we went with a design philosophy that would allow us to scale. So it is a basically a homogenous unit that can be scaled up uh, with, you know, with a number of servers. And we started asking the question, you know, what could we do? You know, would it make sense for Microsoft to start thinking about putting FPGAs into every single one of its servers? And of course, to justify that, we have to start expanding the list of workloads that we would want to support. And I'll get into that in a couple of slides later. Um, so the real question is now, if we, if we get to this point where we have an FPGA in every single server, what would that get us? So first, the homogeneity, homogeneity is preserved. That's great. Um, we know that FPGAs are very low power. Uh, and also for us, it's a relatively low overhead in the cost per server. Uh, an FPGA is basically you know, a way to emulate an ASIC. Right? You can essentially put any type of circuit that you want on there they can imagine and implement on the FPGA. So it really gives you the maximum flexibility to implement any type of accelerator. The downside, of course, is that for some workloads like CNNs, DNNs, you're likely to get less peak performance than a GPU or an ASIC. So this is a balance between something that's general purpose, general purpose programmable specialized hardware, versus something that's very good at a particular range of tasks. So now the question is, if you went with this approach, what would be the gap now between this programmable hardware um, that's wimpier than your GPU uh, and the GPU, for instance, uh, and could you potentially overtake that through scale, right? Just by the fact that you can actually deploy these things widely all over the data center, uh, could you actually you know, be comparable to a dedicated smaller GPU cluster, or if not better? So that's the question we're trying to get to today. So this is just a, a recap from uh, last year's announcement. This is a uh, snapshot of a Wired article describing uh, the Catapult architecture, uh, the Catapult FPGAs going to our data centers. And, there, uh, my good friend Andrew Putnam talked about a, a Bing ranking pilot where we essentially, on 1,600 machines, uh, showed that uh, you could basically speed up the, the, the throughput of each node uh, by a factor of two while maintaining the same tail latency, which is a big deal uh, for Bing ranking. We could do so at basically less than the 30% cost overhead per server uh, and within a 25 watt power envelope because the FPGAs are such a low power. So logically, this is just kind of cartoon of how the architecture is organized. So every server essentially has a locally attached FPJ. And what's unique about the architecture is that the FPJs uh, have a sort of a private network between them uh, that allows them to have very low latency, high bandwidth communication to their neighbors. Um, and this is kind of what we call the catapult fabric. What's great about this is that a lot of uh, data center services and workloads have a lot of different algorithms, and it's unlikely that at the single node level, you'll be able to fit all of that functionality into that spatial fabric. So having these high, this, this fabric actually allows us to scale beyond the capacity of a single uh, node. 
So in this example, we actually, uh, this is actually uh, in, in, the, in the pilot, we did eight FPGAs uh, implementing a web search uh, pipeline. Uh, and each CPU basically talked to its local FPJ, but the FPJs would actually route requests amongst them without any knowledge of the CPU, right? So we had you know, basically hundreds of nanoseconds of communication between the hops, uh, and, then, and then we could have multiple CPUs actually sharing these services that have been mapped onto groups of FPJs. And of course, this led to the question of you know, what other things could we start uh, putting on, 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 these, on this fabric. This is kind of a zoomed in view of the catapult card. Uh, I won't talk too much about this, as has been discussed before, but basically it's a Stratix D5 FPJ, it's a mid-end FPJ, has some local uh, DRAM and is, uh, has a three by eight PCI Express. This is kind of the uh, server that it fits, to, it fits into, and you can see that we're operating under very austere conditions. It's a half U blade, um, and you can see that the FPJ is actually slotted into the little corner over there and sits behind the exhaust of basically two Xeon processors. So the inlet temperature is actually pretty high. Um, and so we had to basically design a form factor that would, work, that would be compliant with kind of the, 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 the data center skew, that's, uh, the blade skew that we're putting into all our machines. Um, this is something that uh, was not announced last year, and this is actually new. This is um, kind of a successor to, uh, to, to the catapult architecture I described just now. This was uh, presented by Mark Rasanovich, uh, who's the CTO of Azure, uh, talking about now using FPGAs uh, for smart NICs. So this is FPGAs for accelerating software-defined networking. Um, and I think this is, this is the, the reason I put this slide up here is really to point out the power of the flexibility of 3 j Not only can it be used to do things like being ranking, it also can be used to do things like line rate uh, encryption and decryption, uh, line rate uh, compression, decompression. So this is another scenario uh, where we think the FPGA uh, could be very useful for, uh, for, uh, for the cloud. Okay, so now onto the deep learning part. So, of course, you know, harnessing Catapult for deep CNNs, uh, I don't think I need to dwell on this too much. So just a little bit of background. Uh, this is the figure that I think many uh, machine learning uh, practitioners are quite familiar with. This was the uh, neural network uh, that was presented by the University of Toronto Group at NIPS 2012 and showing basically uh, how uh, you could construct and train uh, uh, five convolutional neural networks and three uh, dense layers. And, and the idea here is that you start with an image on the left side of, as an input to the network. So this here is a picture of a dog. And basically, um, the network has already been trained to learn uh, features at different sort of hierarchically. So uh, as you go along the network, it's higher levels of abstraction. So at the lowest end, you have things like edges and lines. And then you get further up, you start having more complex structures. And when you get to the very end, there's a bit vector that says, OK, with a one hot encoded bit vector that says, OK, this is very likely uh, to be a dog. OK, so the computation, uh, where you actually spend most of your ops is in the 3D convolution step. And this is basically the motif that we're targeting uh, in the acceleration. So the way this works is that you have your input, uh, essentially a set of activations. So I'll call it a 3D volume. And you have a set of 3D kernel weights. And the, idea, the computation is you take uh, each of these kernel weights, and then you basically superimpose it into some region, overlapping region of your input. And basically, any overlapping region in, in, in these volumes, that's a dot product, right? So every pairwise point inside uh, that's overlapped between the kernel weights and the input, uh, that forms a dot product. And that's computing a single, uh, I'll call it output pixel. And then when you're done with that, the next output pixel, you're going to shift over that kernel uh, by some stride length and sort of keep doing this ad nauseum until you get to basically uh, one plane on the output. And then you're going to repeat this with a second kernel, et cetera. So you can see that actually this is a really dense computation. It's very, very compute intensive. And for the same input, you get a significant amount of reuse. So this is something where having a high computational throughput would really, really help. OK, so this is what we built. This is a, a CNN accelerator building block. Um, and this maps onto a single one of our FPGAs. Um, it's got a couple of uh, interesting design characteristics. One is uh, it's designed to be as configurable as possible, both statically and dynamically. So uh, you can, for instance, configure the numerical precision of this thing. So if you think that a 16-bit fixed point is going to work for you, you can do it. Uh, in our case, uh, we look at uh, mapping this to the ARIA-10, which actually has hardened uh, floating points, so you can do 32-bit floats. Uh, it's, 
it's configurable at runtime in the sense that you can dial in different layer parameters, and then the engine can basically go off and process a sequence of layers uh, off, uh, in, uh, basically uh, without any inter intervention from the host. You can also dial in things like the layer dimensions, the stride, the pooling parameters. Um, one of the uh, things uh, that's interesting about this architecture, it's meant to be composable, so over multiple engines. So you can, on the, as I mentioned, on the Catapult Fabric, you can have more than one FPGA in your hardware service. Uh, you can actually uh, take a net network and actually pipeline that across different building blocks. So that's one feature we implemented. Um, it's also very efficient in the sense that um, we have, we're, in taking advantage of the FPGA Fabric is that you can send uh, data from producers directly to consumers. Right, without even necessarily having to go to DRAM. So we have a mode of operation where we have essentially a bunch of on-chip buffers, we load up the layers, and then we do the computation, and then the, the data doesn't even go out to the host or to the memory, it goes back uh, into a, a second buffer, so this is double buffering. And this is great because it actually saves us a memory controller, so we actually don't even have to put down a memory controller. Now this is assuming that your layers can actually fit. If they can't fit, then either a higher level software uh, program needs to partition the work into smaller pieces, or you, know, you can actually instantiate a memory controller and do the buffering uh, into DRAM. Um, and so to do this sort of output to input recirculation, we implemented a very efficient uh, memory on, uh, network on chip that's customized kind of for this purpose. Uh, this is just kind of a much more detailed view, uh, structural diagram of what, what the data path and control looks like. So the way it works is that we have basically a parallel array of parallel set of rows and uh, parallel rows of, of functional units, where each functional unit essentially is a uh, multiply accumulator. Um, one of the things about this computation is done, it's done very synchronously and systolically. So what happens is that we have a set of kernel buffers along the bottom of the row, and that's where we buffer up each of the kernels. And what we're doing is doing a broadcast along uh, the vertical, uh, along the vertical lines. And then what you're doing is you're taking the inputs and parallelizing them across the rows, and then the input pixels are basically being matched with the kernels, and it's all done basically very synchronously. And this essentially minimizes buffering and also gets us a very, very high reuse of the data. Uh, and also the, you know, the data actually can propagate in basically in a systolic fashion, so all the communication is for the most part uh, local. So this allows us to get a very high clock rates and to be able to scale uh, to basically very large fabrics. Um, I want to also mention is that the architecture has two modes of operation, one where it can be latency op optimized, where you can take a single image and try to do the classification as fast as possible. Another mode is you can actually batch, throw in a bunch of images at a time uh, and have the engine work on them in parallel. So you, know, it's optim you can basically configure it for latency or throughput. Okay, so let me just go ahead and switch to a quick demo. So this is a demo that we brought up with the, um, the Digital Cortex team. We basically took their software infrastructure for doing uh, classification and training, and what we did is basically plugged in the FPGA. And this is running uh, on a Stratix 5 uh, FPGA on one of the, the servers that I showed you in the pictures earlier. Um, and you can see that you know, when you light up the FPGA, you get a significant uh, bump in throughput. Uh, on the left-hand side, you actually have the software running on basically the two CPU sockets uh, going at fast, as fast as it can. Uh, and then when the FPGA turns on, it's, it's, it's doing significantly better. So we can go back to the slides. Okay, I'll... I'll, I'll All right, so what do the numbers look like? So first thing I'm gonna do is present you the CPU numbers versus the FPGA numbers. Okay, so on the first row, um, I wanna mention that this, the number that we're running for the first one is a little different than what we saw in the demo. Uh, this is a slightly different model and we were using uh, the open source software which uh, along with MKL on Linux. So this is uh, a 16 core two socket Xeon uh, 2.1 gigahertz and we're getting about you know, 53 uh, images per second classified. So this is on the problem of ImageNet 1K. Um, and you can see that um, you know, the server 
uh, is getting about you know 27% utilization of flop. So there is some headroom there, but you know uh, this is sort of you know using already very tuned dense linear uh, libraries to do the classification. Um, one column that's of interest, I think, and, and we get a lot of questions about is you know what is the energy efficiency of doing this? And so uh, what I have in the second to last column there is uh, the estimated uh, peak power with the server included. And so uh, this is a kind of approximate number. It's not exact. Uh, so this is about 225 watts. And if you were to take the throughput and normalize it to that, you, know, you get a number of about 0.3. So the next row is uh, shown for an experiment done on a newer FPGA. Uh, which is on the ARIA-10 uh, GX 1150. And this is running on Windows Server. And we see that with the FPGA, we're getting about a 7x uh, improvement uh, in throughput. Uh, one of the things to note is that the FPGA has a peak throughput of one point, uh, th about 1.4 teraflops. That's actually a pretty big milestone for FPGAs, because uh, traditionally, like for instance, in the Stratix 5, uh, you only had uh, good support for fixed point, but not floating point. Uh, and actually, a lot of uh, ML practitioners we worked with would much rather prefer to work with floating point. Um, but you can see that the FPGA is doing pretty decently and gets about 38% uh, utilization uh, of the available flops. Uh, and you know, we're getting a pretty nice bump in the efficiency. So now another question we get is, um, OK, what about a GPU? How well would a high-end, super awesome GPU get you? Uh, and so they really give us a run for the money. So if you take uh, these are very uh, recent uh, tuned libraries uh, running on state-of-the-art hardware that just came out in March this year. So this is on an NVIDIA Titan X. Uh, GPU blows everything away. It's, it's an amazing device. Um, it's it's kind of jaw-dropping. It's about 4,129 uh, images per second. The device is capable of you know, uh, about four to five times peak that of the FPGA, about 6.1 teraflops. And uh, there's been a lot of amazing work done in the community on tuning uh, these dense linear out, uh, kernels uh, on, these, on these GPUs. And so they're getting close to about 94% utilization uh, of, of available flops. And that's, that's really incredible. Of course, all of this comes with a price. And this is a very conservative estimate here, where essentially, if you take the server and you put that GPU in there, it's going to be you know, 475 watts of power. But in aggregate, you know, that's still a reasonable energy for op, right? So if this is the only workload you're running. This is not a bad way to go. OK, so now one of the things we're doing here in this calculation is that we're factoring in uh, total server power. But that's not exactly quite right. Because in the data center, you often have many tenants. And so the CPUs in these workloads are actually mostly idling. So you know, if, if you're doing the offloading, it doesn't mean that the CPUs are basically locked up. You can still essentially use them to do other kinds of work. right? So it's not clear you actually want to include the server when you're, when you're talking about the efficiency of just the computation you care about. So here are some estimates that are more uh, based on what we think the, the power consumption would look like if we were just looking at the device by itself. And there, uh, the FPGA isn't looking too shabby. So it's getting about you know, 12 to 13 uh, energy uh, uh, giga ops per joule. Um, it's not like an order of magnitude off from, from the GPU. So, so we know the FPGA is doing uh, pretty decently here. One thing I want to point out is that we're comparing an underutilized FPGA. We have a small team of developers you know, have cranked on this for a short time, compared to an entire community that has worked really hard to make this run fast on a GPU. So we know that we actually have uh, quite a bit of headroom. And in fact, you know, so this is an, uh, these are numbers that you know, please don't hold, them, uh, hold me to them. These are just projections. But we think that if we were to devote a lot of engineering into floor planning and also scaling up the design to maximize all the DSPs in the design, we think we could push that to probably uh, 880 images per second. There, we're getting close to about 89% of flop utilization of the chip. Uh, and there, we now start to see some really interesting uh, energy efficiency numbers. Again, this is just a projection. But you know, even the numbers without the projection, we think, are, are actually pretty promising. So now we know that, you know, effectively, um, if we put in a lot of hard work and we get the FPGA to be within about a fifth of the GPU, I think this is where we enter a really really interesting space. So going back to the question of, you know, do we think uh, FPGAs are promising target in the data center for deep learning? Uh, here's what we think would be the case. We think that the best case FPJ would probably at best be about a fifth of the best case GPU throughput. And so the question is, now, if I have you know, five times as many uh, servers in my data center as I do GPUs, right? Um, you know, I could potentially actually overcome that through scale and maybe even do better if my workload scales. 
And one thing that's important to note is that although the CNNs are the ideal workload on the GPUs, FPGAs with hardened FPU FPUs aren't actually that shabby. And I think this is made possible by a lot of the recent developments you're seeing coming out of the uh, ARIA family. One thing I want to note is also what I'm really excited about are the Stratix 10 FPGAs uh, that are going to actually push that up another notch. So the Stratix 10s are actually going to be running uh, on the uh, Intel process and uh, you know, we'll have up to 10 teraflops uh, per device. So now I think this is where the space gets really interesting. So today we're about, you know, about seven times faster than a multi-core CPU. Uh, and at the same time, I want to point out is that we're not just building this data center, we're not building just this infrastructure for deep learning, but we also have to support a large number of our diverse cloud scenarios. So that's a trade-off that we may be willing to work to, to live with. So do we think it's promising? Yes. OK. Um, there's been a large body of related work. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of uh, interest in using uh, ASICs uh, to do uh, CNN acceleration, a number of recent publications on this. Um, and I think the problem with the ASIC, again, goes back to the inflexibility. So if you go and harden a piece of silicon just for this workload, uh, but your workloads change or your mixture changes, uh, you just don't have the agility to adapt to different, uh, different ways of doing it. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of work on FPGAs, and I think a lot of them focus kind of on a single node and not necessarily about scale out. And so we're really thinking about in the context of data centers. I'll just sort of hint that the reason why we have a multi-stage, uh, the ability to compose multiple FPGAs is so that we can actually build a scalable training pipeline. Uh, that's not something we're quite ready to talk about yet. And of course, there's a lot of work on GPUs and appliances. So that concludes my talk, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Hey, John. Uh, John Worsnick, UC Berkeley. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about your design methodology. It looks like there's a lot of regularity in your data path. Did you take advantage of that and lay it out or just leave it to the tools to You know, to we do left it to do? the tools and we got pretty good results when we cranked it and we got, you know, about 270 megahertz. But I think we're going to need a little bit of floor planning to actually push it to the max, the F max for the DSPs, which is what we're aiming for. Um, what, what, what would you expect the maximum frequency for, to be? Uh, we're actually aiming for about 450 megahertz. Do the tools give you what you need in order to do that level of planning? You know, I've played around with lock regions quite a bit, and I think it does. I think it, it, it just takes time and effort um, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Craig Wittenbrink, and I'm from NVIDIA. I had a, a question on the power comparisons. So I was wondering why you would consider using essentially the maximum performance GPU like the Titan when you're looking essentially at like a TDP limited and perhaps you could consider, you know, a 40 watt GPU like one that's targeted for a laptop and then you could compare the perf per watt. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, we we want to do that and I think, uh, I think that would make GPUs more attractive for deployment at scale. Again, going back to the scenarios that we have to support, um, you know, for instance, uh, doing the line rate encryption and decryption, I think the, for the moment, it seems like the FPJ would be a better choice. Okay, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Kay. Uh, do you have any plans to release, uh, uh, releasing a smart NIC to public? I mean, uh, I want, uh, I'm really eager to test it on my Azure account. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I can't make any comments on that. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Sanjay Gongalor, NVIDIA. A um, couple of questions. One, thank you for sharing uh, some very good data about uh, CPUs versus FPGAs versus GPUs. Mm -hmm. One of the um, fact uh, metrics that data centers also look at is perf per dollar. You, you showed the perf per watt. Can you talk about that? I, I, unfortunately, I would love to, but I can't. Re this very sensitive information, obviously, with our partners. So I can only say that you know, what we published last year was that the cost of the FPJ, that particular part that we used, did not exceed 30% the cost of the server. Okay, thank you. And the other, other question uh, uh, is, uh, you know, do F the FPGAs need to be reconfigured for different workloads, which would be a little different than, you know, um, running different workloads on a general purpose CPU or a GPU? Yeah, absolutely. So the reconfiguration times, right now we've gotten it to about under a second. So we can reconfigure from flash, and so that's the time scale you're working. Thank you.
Don Stark from Google. Um, so at IDF, Intel announced plans to to basically have uh, closer collaboration between CPUs and FPGAs. I'm curious whether you've had a chance to look at that and, and how well uh, this CNN application would map to that kind of architecture. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in this particular workload, there isn't a ton of fine grain sharing between the CPU and the FPJ. So you might be streaming activations and images from the host, but it's all bulk transfer. So things like coherence aren't necessarily going to provide us a big benefit. So, um, so unfortunately, I don't think it would provide that much benefit. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, the speaker. All right. Thank you all.